go a bit gonzo. And that's where I'll leave you. <laughs> Right. Um, Aaron told me not to panic if my presentation doesn't come up straight. <laughs> oh, good. Well done. Right. Um, so, how do I plan? Um, I I'm going to talk about five things that I do when I plan, or that are important to me when I plan. Uh, but then I thought, okay, I don't want this to sound dry or dense, you know. So, and I've got this thing about me that you should know straight away, which is, I'm just putting out there, I think style is as important as substance. And I know this may sound controversial coming from a planner, but how we wrap our thinking, how we wrap the data, you know, <laughs> how we wrap our ideas, it's, 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 it can make the difference between good and great, can create that magic in the pitch room or in the creative presentation. So, you know, um, and then on that note, I thought, okay, so how can I approach these five, five things that I do in a way that uh, you guys are going to enjoy the session? So that takes me to, I mean, I don't know if you guys have seen, uh, I mean, Black Mirror and the latest iteration of Black Mirror, which is called Bandersnatch. Have you? Yeah. All right. Well, but for those that haven't, basically what it is, Bandersnatch is, is, a, is an interactive film where the audience can, uh, can choose, uh, ask to make choices and the choices that they make can actually lead to totally different sort of like um, story arcs and plots and, and the plots can go from totally ordinary to completely bonkers and apparently there are 10 to 12 endings, I haven't quite made it to those. Anyway, I'm not making like 10 to 12 narratives here but I decided to approach my presentation and make it interactive which means that you guys have a role to play this evening, okay? Uh, and I am just for the sake of the argument, call it, I'm going to call it Planner Snatch. <laughs> the first truly interactive <laughs> APG noisy, noisy thinking talk. Um, and as you would expect, you know, dear audience, over to you. Um, do you accept this <laughs> and have a swell time? Even if, to, if it is to make me sweat here because, you know, hyperlinks and the technology might actually let me down. And that in itself would be unpredictable and, and, and that in itself is highly entertaining. Uh, or do you refuse this? In which case, you know. Um, <laughs> well, let, actually, for the sake of argument, for the sake of argument, let's click refuse. Well... Then you get the non-interactive and totally ordinary version. <laughs> and I'm sure that that's not what you guys want. So, anyway, there you go. Accept. <laughs> I'm making the decision for you. <laughs> but, but you guys need to, need to interact in the next few ones. Okay, so, um, okay, the first, the first thing I do, uh, I mean, the first thing that kind of like matters to me, it's about resilience. It's about never letting go. Um, I think most uh, most planners, I think uh, probably the more junior mid ones, mid weight ones, uh, think that planning is this sort of like uh, you know the ones starting the industry. Think planning is like this linear, rigorous progression of data triangles, beautifully crafted Venn diagrams that sort of like lead to this utterly brilliant thought that is perfect, and then everybody can see it straight away and buy it straight away. But that is, we all, you know, not true, it's fake news, fake news. Um, the truth is, and uh, I'm here to tell you that in my, tour, my, my 18 years in planning, uh, that has never been the case, uh, not once. I probably should tell you about the wonderful messiness there is the planning process. Um, uh, that, well, it's kind of both chaotic and wonderful, and, 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 and out of that comes brilliancy. Um, uh, 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 I came up with this analogy that is kind of like the game of life, you know, I probably should tell you and prepare you for all the resilience and the tough skin that you will need when you come to work and you're super excited about your brief and your creatives 
fucking hate it and think it's shit. And, uh, and, uh, and you know, uh, that kind of feels like a tornado hits your house and it's, the house is not insured. But in the game of life, obviously, not in real life, some perspectives, advertising after all. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, but it kind of like feels really like, uh, you know, get, it can get you down. But, you know, but I should also tell you about the wonderful feeling that is working for 12 months or 18 months on, on a campaign. And it's out in the world and it's not one of the collateral things out in the world. It's actually something that makes a cultural dent and it feels like payday. You know, it's like, you know, but in order for that to happen, I think that the important thing is for a planner to stay close to, to everything beginning to end. The role of the planner really never stops. So, I mean, in my opinion, but over to the audience. When should planners let go? Um, when the idea is bought and in the making or never, never, ever? Not leading the question, by the way. Never, ever, ever. Just for the sake of, you know, Picking the wrong answer. Uh, when the idea is bought and in the making, uh, you should try again. Uh, I think, you know, uh, all the, you know, all your Super Bowl, super social, amazing strategy and that Twitter takeover that you sold to the client originally with a two minute epic emotionally, emotional, emotion driving film has all, is all gone because the media just stepped in. You were not in the meeting. And now half of the budget is being put on a media partnership and the other half is being used on a 30 second TV led daytime plan. <laughs> so yeah, you should try again. So never, never, ever. Um, uh, so stay, staying close and never letting go is important because that's the only way to dodge the, uh, what I call the planning twilight zone. Is, is when the bad stuff happens and you're not there. And you're probably thinking, well, if bad stuff happens, you're not there, that's a good thing. No, not a good thing. Um, um, because you're not there to protect the work, no, not there to protect the idea. That, and forgive me, because you won't be able to read that, but that's, imagine that as the creative development process. And just between us, because we are fellow, you know, planners and friends, I'm gonna tell you the secret location of the planning twilight zone. It's right there after it's sold. Normally, you are immediately not copied in meetings and you're sort of like not part of the process. And I think it's, it's you need to proactively try to sort of like be there. So, first thing, first thing that's important to me and that I try to do is just my planning never stops. And that's kind of like me briefing and that's me pro during production process and PPMs. <laughs> okay, so. <laughs> The second thing is about fluidity of style. So we all been talking about styles and, and stuff, and I think Craig kind of like talks about actually all styles are great styles. You know, every, every style is needed. Uh, but he tried to argue that you know his style is better. Fine, okay. Um, uh, so what I thought I could do here is like, uh, well, which planning style is your style? I don't know if you guys ever play. There's this game online which is like, which Wes Anderson character are you? So I tried to sort of like. <laughs> So I tried to follow the same, this a similar kind of style, and I kind of. So are you the EQ sensei? You know the emotion, emotional lighthouse, the sort of like empathy lighthouse. You know you are in a room with your clients, with your creatives. You're one with everyone. You know you are the beam of light in the meeting. You know you have this spidey sense. You just you just know what your client is thinking, and you use your power with great responsibility, and and uh, and uh, and uh, change the course of the meeting and sell the idea. You know, is that you? Um, um, or are you the creative strategist? God, you're creative. You got this. Creatives love you. You know, when they know there's a brief coming to the department and you wrote it, they don't just want to work on it. They fight to be in the briefing session. You know, um, you love riffing off your creatives. You write your brief, you co-write your briefs with them. You know, is that you? Is that your style? Or are you a the Byron Les aficionado? You're all about driving effectiveness through reach, fame, emotion, you know, uh, in your beautiful planning. 
um, you know, you, all, 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 all that beautiful planning of yours and the beautiful universe of planning uh, uh, expressed in the sort of like a, a, a perfectly shaped bar, bar chart uh, bell curve that ends up in Tom Roach's um, Twitter feed. <laughs> Is that you? Or... Are you the culture ninja? You're there in the trenches, you know, in the real world with the real people. You know, your planning, you know, your planning doesn't, doesn't care about Adlan. You care about, you know, making cultural dance in, in, you know, beyond the realms of Adlan in real life. So, you know, in finding those amazing cultural truths and tensions, you know, is that you? Or are you the data wizard? Ten rolls of data, no manners to you. You get your cup of tea ready, in you go. <laughs> out out come, comes amazing insight, you know, that nobody thought of, you know, the dark side of the moon, the, the data that, you know, you never looked at the data in that way. You know, is that you? And I think the, fun, the interesting thing is, uh, there is no right answer, and there's no need to choose. Uh, because all, all these styles, are styles that you need in your life. I think the best planner is certainly, you know, my biggest mentors like Craig, you know, Richard Huntington, you know, Jim Carroll, Nick Hendler, I could name them all here. But the one thing I learned from them is that you should never pigeonhole yourself with a style. Actually, the, the clients, they differ. That's the beauty of what we do. We get exposed to different clients, different business problems. Uh, 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 and, and you need to have the ability to adapt. So second thing for me is the best style is freestyle. You know, the fluidity in your style. Third thing, um, and this one is about precision and inventiveness in how you frame the problem and how you frame the ambition. Um, Le Tigre, Magnum, Blue Steel, all, <laughs> all so different. <laughs> Um, so, when defining the problem, or the challenge, or the ambition, do you play back the client's articulation, or do you reframe it to inspire? Reframe it to inspire. Correct. <laughs> um, there is no such thing as interesting, there is a right and wrong answer. <laughs> so, I think that on this one, uh, I, I'm going to take you through a few examples of things that uh, I worked on, but, um, you know, fridge raiders uh, uh, is a meat snack, uh, you know, and, uh, and I think, you know, the issue there, I could easily have come to the client and, say, and play back the challenge, which is, you know, low penetration and meat snack is not a habit, you know, that's the challenge, you need to turn it into, we need to change the habit, we need to turn it into a habit. But no, and the way, the way we frame it, which made the client quite excited, is change and the creatives, is because, you ra because in doing so, you kind of like raise the, 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 the ambition. It's changed this from a nation of crisp snackers with nice to penetration, that's the penetration of crisps in, in the UK, to a nation of protein snackers. Um, the other thing that, you know, another way to frame, and this one was not so much problem, more, more to do with the ambition. You know, we could have uh, framed it to fridge raisers again. Uh, you know, it's all about getting teens to, to try or to snack on meat when they're gaming, and there are about three million teenagers that do that every day. But, um, but no, uh, the way we frame it, again, to raise the creative ambition behind the brand and the focus was to make, to make refrigerators to gaming while popcorn is to film. Um, next one, apprenticeships. I feel really proud of this one. I think, well, you know, the thing with apprenticeships is like everyone knows about them, so the, the, there isn't an awareness issue there. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, again, we could have easily played back, oh, you know, you don't have an awareness issue, you have a consideration issue, but then why? You know, what is the real problem here? And when, you know, we did a lot of double maths in this one, a lot of data crunching, and, 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 um, and I think that where we ended up with this was like the client uh, originally uh, had a, a target, and the target required us to double the, the, the number of intakes, or, or, or apprenticeship intakes for the same kind of like comms, 
budget. And what we said to them, look, the only way you can achieve this is by creating the seismic reframe of apprenticeships in culture, because actually people just see apprenticeships as a lesser career choice, a plan B. You only go there really if you, if you can't get anywhere else. That's how people see it at least. They don't really understand that apprenticeship has cha have changed, it's not the mechanic in the garage and all that. So, you know, so that's how we frame it from, you know, let's, let's, let's shift it from lesser to proper, from burden to blessing, from cheap to invaluable, from plan B to active choice, from an apology to a badge to where we pride. The work is beautiful, it was launched last week. It's very different, it's not barrier-led, it's very aspirational. This is another one, and I think this is, I love this one because it's so simple, and, and by, by a small shift, uh, uh, so by shifting the, the creative uh, ambition to, from regaining 1% value share loss to regaining cultural leadership, you are immediately complete, significantly impacting the caliber of the idea and the work that not only you get from your creative teams, but the work that the client wants to see, expects to see uh, in the room. Um, and then the other one, last one, uh, this was for Home Away. A home away is a uh, uh, Airbnb competitor, but actually they were the very first uh, um, uh, holiday kind of like rental uh, accommodation sites, and they were the biggest. But, but obviously in 2014, um, Airbnb took over because they were a marketplace and Airbnb was turning into a global brand. Uh, and not only that, Airbnb by then had the, their, their comms budget was 19 times. Uh, bigger than home aways. And so I, ex this exact image, which I Googled, and that was the first thing that came up when I wrote, you know, when I Googled the bullies eating our lunch. <laughs> so that was the exact image that I put in front of the founder of home away. And then we talked about, you know, the bullies eating our lunch, what are we going to do about this? And because up until that point, the, the behavior of the brand was of a dominant leader. So what do you do when you're outspent by your competitor? And not only that, your competitor has the budget of a leader and the behavior of a challenger brand. You're sort of like, fuck, so what do you do? <laughs> and then we talked about, okay, gloves are off. You know, let's behave as the challenger of a challenger. You know, they do a stunt, they do a Super Bowl, we make a cultural dent. And I'm going to come on to talk about what we did um, in the next one. But I think that so this one is all about so it, the importance of framing problems and framing uh, challenges uh, uh, comes because it's all about making your clients and making your creatives see that there's only one choice. You know, it's, not, it's no longer about having to pick a difficult choice or a brave choice. It's, there's only one choice. And I think that's, that it, there's a skill in that. And by the way, for those that love Game of Thrones, best, best, best episode, Battle of the Bastards, is that moment when Jon Snow is up against an entire army. What shall we do? There's nothing else, it's the only choice. Anyway, um, <laughs> but I digress. Uh, so, um, um, number four, um, culture. I mean, all the amazing and disturbing things in culture, you know. It's all brilliant, and I think, you know, uh, we should all, as planners, kind of like embrace it, understand it, uh, because the truths and the tensions out there are, is what helps make the, our thinking and the work that comes out of our thinking relevant. So on Home Away, and back to Home Away now, uh, the starting point of this one uh, was in culture, and it started with the sharing economy and the impact of the sharing economy in how we people behave. Um, so uh, 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 the interesting thing about the sharing economy is that it normalized oversharing. Things that you would normally never ever imagine that you ever share, like your house, your car, your dog, all of a sudden it's okay to share. Well, or at least, you know, it's kind of like okay, uh, you know, uh, uh, on the surface. So the cultural truth is we live in the age of oversharing. But then, when I started to dig into the, the consumer tracking the data from home away, <laughs> the brilliant thing I discovered was this stat of 72% of people prefer not to share their holidays with strangers. So at the end of the day, hell is other people. 
really. You know, forget the, the whole the whole sharing economy thing is a lie. <laughs> um, uh, which, which took us to the human truth of, you know, yes, we are in the, in the age of sharing or oversharing, but deep down people really don't like sharing. And then home away, the interesting thing and the big difference between home away and Airbnb is Airbnb, by then, 50% of their inventory was shared. And home away only, share, only deals with, uh, with the whole house, so only whole, whole properties. Uh, which took us to the brand truth of the whole house. And that's how we got to this challenger of a challenger campaign. They had a pop at Airbnb called Why Share. Uh, and in that spirit of trumping, you know, Airbnb, we took over the Eiffel Tower and we made it to Jim Fa Jimmy Fallon and all the big publications out there. So big culture than that. So make it matter in the real world is the kind of like fourth thing. Last but not least, you know, what is, which one is more important? The brief or the briefing of the creatives? Briefing. To write. Briefing. Uh, I think, look, the interesting thing about this is uh, I think all you want is your creators to leave the room wanting nothing else than to work on your brief. And that's the most important thing. The other thing is the whole us versus them. I think, you know, I love the fact that, uh, I, you know, I write my briefs with the creatives. Uh, we work together in shaping the ideas and crafting it. So we are one team. When uh, one of my, my absolute loved working with these guys, they left Saatchi and Saatchi when I worked there, and they wrote me this lovely note, which, and they said, sorry for breaking the band. And I think that sort of like captures how I feel creatives and planners should work together. So the, my last thing is, you know, we planning. You know, there's no such thing as us and them. There's we, and planning is better when creatives are, in the, you know, you take them on the journey with you. And that's that.